So I can't get out of Hebrews. We're still in Hebrews, but now we're in Hebrews 6. And uh, if you got that, let's look back at where he was just reading. We'll go to Hebrews 5. Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> in the last couple verses there, verse 13 and verse 14, it says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So, come into this world, drinking milk, right? Who, who all in here is still on milk, right? Everybody's pretty much eating meat now, right? We've got a bunch of grown up. I did know, hey, it's good to have some visitors here, a lot of young ones. I did know that one day we would have more kids in this work than adults. I knew that day would come, and so here it is. <laughs> anyway, so glad to have you all. But everybody eats meat, right? Y'all eat meat? No vegetarians. I mean, I don't. <laughs> but uh, uh, when you're young, you eat milk. And if I had a baby, you know, just kind of still on the milk and said, hey, you know, I think I'm just going to start giving them a steak, right? That just wouldn't work so good. No. Grandparents often try to give them stuff that you don't want them to give them, right? That just... That, that has happened to us before, <laughs> but you would never give them a steak. You wouldn't give them meat. That's for somebody who's grown up, right? Now, Hebrews 6, <clears throat> let me tell you real quick why, I, why I'm going this direction, <clears throat> because I'm trying to spend uh, some time going over various, uh, maybe some doctrines, pr probably more often like policies that we would have as a church that I would, uh, I would want to make sure that we are all on the same page on this. But primarily when it comes to doctrine, I feel like if we're going to talk about doctrines that we must hold and policies that we must enforce, I got to give a big warning from the Bible on this. And I think Hebrews 6 is a place to go uh, for that. A big warning about what our focus needs to be as a church. Doctrine is super, super important. Okay. Uh, however, a couple things to consider. Number one, people could spend so much time on doctrine right, that they're not doing the work that they're supposed to do, right, for one, one thing. You could be spending too much time on the doctrine, you're not doing the work. Uh, second thing is this, if you have good, sound doctrine, but you live a wicked life, if you have good, sound doctrine, but you just, like, disobey everything, you know, that the Bible says to do, or whatever, you're just disobedient to God's Word, or whatever, then in a manner of speaking, I started to title the message, when doctrine becomes meaningless, but really the doctrine's always going to be good. Good doctrine's good doctrine. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't lose its meaning. But I would say maybe this way: when doctrine becomes useless, you know, there's an old saying I used to hear uh, a lot, saying people don't know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You ever heard that? I think maybe this could kind of go, uh, that could maybe apply to this lesson today. Okay, you guys know all the doctrine in the world. You might be able to correct everybody on their false doctrine and uh, set them straight, know all the ins and outs of the Bible, have all the scriptures memorized, and yet you could live a life that would make you practically useless for God. Okay, And, and that's what we want to talk about. So if you notice those scriptures, uh, verse 13 and 14 of chapter 5 talks about, you know, when you're a babe, you had milk. Right, and then those who who grow up, uh, they have strong meat. You know, they're, they're they're the full age, and they have strong meat. And I think that sets us up for chapter six, which brother Justin just read. But look at verse the first couple verses again. Therefore, right, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Doctrine of Christ is good, right? We we've got to have good doctrine uh, in Sunday school and Iola. I'm talking about. The Protestant Reformation, you know, we spent some time talking about Catholicism, and now we're talking about the Reformation. And so I spent a little bit of time this morning talking about creeds. You know, there's the uh, Apostolic Creed, and then there's the Nicene Creed, and, you know, at some point they had the Council of Trent, and there's all these things that people are saying, hey, these are, they even quote them. You know, like they make kids learn these things, and they got to quote these creeds. I believe this and that. Some of it's good stuff, but they, they, they have to say all oh, this creed. As Baptists, as independent Baptists, I wouldn't say that there's a creed. Now, somebody has, some Baptists hold to the 
London Confessions of Faith or whatever. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe in that. Uh, our creed is just simply comes from the Bible, right? And an individual, independent local church says, hey, we're just going to agree on certain, you know, definitions and certain things from the Bible. And so I would think that this chapter right here, when it comes to doctrine, though, would tell us like this is what we need to concern ourselves with. In fact, it calls it the doctrine of Christ. This is Christ began this church. We talked about that Thursday. And so now he's, he began his church and here are his doctrine leaving. But it, but it's saying this leaving those doctrines. Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of here we go. Here are the doctrines. Here are the doctrines of Christ. Everybody should be on the same page on these doctrines, okay? On the doctrine of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Acts 20, 21 says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You see kind of that idea there. It's when somebody turns to belief in Christ, turns to uh, salvation, then, uh, then they're turning that to God. That's, that's the doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of Christ, right, is the first thing. Repentance from dead works, you know, everybody trusted in their works to get them to heaven. I mean, that's pretty much two, two types of belief systems out there when it comes to uh, salvation. One is, I can work my way to heaven. The other is, I got to accept God's gift, right? That's pretty much it. There's no other way. And so, uh, and so the Bible uh, says, calls this one of Christ's doctrine, the repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Another one, verse 2, of the doctrine of baptisms. Okay, and I'm not going to spend time uh, going through all these right now. But we could teach a little class on soteriology, learn the doctrine of salvation. I think everybody's on the same page in here when it comes to salvation. We could uh, talk about baptism, why we baptize, why, why water is involved in baptism, what, you know, there's one baptism in Christ, and we could talk about all the great doctrine. We should do that. We should all be on the same page when it comes to that. We know infant baptism doesn't count. We know baptism uh, uh, for somebody who's not saved doesn't do anything to wash away their sins. We know that the water's not holy. The water doesn't save anybody. We know it's a picture. These are doctrine. This is a doctrine, and we could teach. We could spend time teaching these things. That's great. Uh, the next one says this, the laying on of hands, right? Well, there's a lot of people get confused on this and say, oh, laying on the hands. You know, are we talking about healing people or what? No, if you compare Scripture with Scripture, laying on the hands has to do with ordaining somebody. So we could go to all the qualifications for ordaining a pastor and the qualifications to have a deacon, and they're great. And actually, we're going to look at, at some here in a minute. And we could talk about all those kinds of things. We should be on the same page on this. That's great. And then what does it say? Uh, of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. One of my favorite things to study, one of my favorite things to talk about in times, you know, when is the Lord coming back? You know, where does the tribulation, where's the rapture fit in with the tribulation and all that kind of stuff? This is great. But when is the resurrection of the dead on the time scale? You know, when is uh, the eternal judgment you know, seat of God? We, you know, we talk about, well, there's the great white throne judgment, and then there's a judgment seat of Christ, and great doctrinal stuff. We could talk about these all day. We can learn. We could grow from that, and we should, again, be on the same page when it comes to these things. But here's what he's actually saying. He's saying, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of, and then he lists all these doctrines. He's saying, but let's go, but let's go on to do those things that accompany that salvation. <clears throat> Doctrine is super important. Okay, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. However, we need to move on to do the things that accompany salvation. Just like you wouldn't expect 30, 40 year old man, whatever, to be walking around in a diaper trying to get somebody to change their diaper, drinking out of a bottle. You know, there's some weirdos in this world, okay? But that would be a weird that would be a weirdo, right? A big old grown guy like me walking around in a diaper. If you see that run, okay, he's weird. <laughs> but no, a person has to grow. And so, you know, baby Christians, same way. You get saved, you learn these basic doctrines, you don't spend the rest of your life 
just studying these doctrines and debating these doctrines and fine-tuning those doctrines. I mean, look, you should, hopefully you'll grow, but when it, when, it talks, when it talks about the meat, I actually don't believe that means, yeah, we need to dig deeper and find out, were there 40-foot giants in the land? <laughs> you know, we need to dig deeper. Are there UFOs in the Bible? We need to dig deeper. Now, I don't even know. Those aren't doctrines of Christ by any means. <laughs> but we need to dig a little deeper, you know. When is, uh, uh, tell me more about <coughs> the, the ten horns and the, you know, the last Trump. Are we talking about Trump, you know, Donald Trump, the last Trump? <laughs> <coughs> Some people just want to spend their entire life digging deep and trying to find this doctrine and putting out all this stuff, and they don't do anything for the Lord. Or they live such a, a, a life where you'd watch them and they'd watch their behavior and you'd be like, man, that guy's useless for the cause of Christ, right? Doctrine's important. Obviously, I don't want to hang out with or work with someone that doesn't write on salvation or something like that, but guess what? I would rather have a guy who, when you're talking to him about doc, all these doctrinal, deep doctrinal things, he's like, you know, I'm not really quite sure about that. I mean, salvation, yeah, you better be right on, okay? But I'm not quite sure. Like, I don't think, like, I got some ideas on that, but I'm not quite sure. And you're like, man, this guy doesn't know anything. But he's living a clean life. He's uh, doing the things that the Bible tells him to do. He's, he's, uh, he's honoring, you know, as a young guy, honoring to their parents. That's a great thing. And, uh, and so uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list those things. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> but the doctrines are important, but... Uh, we need to consider this. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. So, of course, you know, doc, doctrine, you think of doctor, teaching, you know, you learning something. In case you don't know, what does he mean by doctrine? Uh, we're just talking about learning things, okay? Things that, um, you know, when you talk about the doctrine of Christ, things that Jesus taught, things you can learn about Christ or whatever. But here's an interesting uh, passage. i got to quit talking and find my place here. Okay, what did I say? First, uh, no, Titus chapter 2. Titus and Timothy, got a lot of parallel passages there, but we're going to just stick with Titus. Titus chapter 2 says this, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now, that doesn't mean that the things that you're speaking are going to be uh, become, I mean, the... Uh, yeah, the things that you're speaking are going to become sound doctrine. Here's what, you know, I think of this word. You ever seen some? You ever heard somebody say that's that's be, that's becoming of you, or that's not becoming of you, right? I think that's the idea. Like, like that's not that's not fitting a fitting thing for you, right? So these are the things that become sound doctrine. That's pretty much what they, what we just read in Hebrews. Okay, the things that accompany salvation, right? These are the things that become sound doctrine. What are they? Look at number two, verse two. That the aged men be sober, grave. I want you to pay attention to these words because I'm going to come back to them. They're really important. Sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Verse 3, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Honestly, it doesn't say women, uh, that the aged women can get on Facebook and argue with the best of them about what is good sound doctrine or not good sound doctrine, right? It doesn't say that you can just school anybody and put them to task about what the Bible says and all the deep doctrine. No, the things that become sound doctrine have to do with your character. They have to do with how you walk, how you live for Christ. What good is the knowledge of something, how something works, right, if you don't put it to the test, right? There are some uh, armchair athletes. You ever met them? <laughs> They couldn't dribble the basketball if their life depended on it. They couldn't throw a, a long Hail Mary pass, you know, spiraling all the way down, whatever. They couldn't do that. But they could tell that coach, you know, how he has to coach the team. And they can tell all the players what they're supposed to be doing. And they think they know everything, right? Yeah. Why don't you get out on the course and you know, throw the ball with us? Yeah. You know, talk is cheap. And so, uh, so here's it, it's, it's this uh, life style that you're seeing. This is the thing that accompanies the doctrines of Christ, okay? 
<clears throat> as you continue through the book of Hebrews, go back to Hebrews. <clears throat> well, actually, keep your place. We, we will be coming back to Hebrews, but <clears throat> go to uh, 2 Peter. I don't know how many times I've already used this since we started this workout here because I love this passage. 2 Peter chapter 2. Think of all the things that we just read from, uh, from Titus, okay, the, the, the behavioral type things. And now pay attention to Peter, and then, uh, and then we're going to look at Hebrews, and it's all going to match up, okay, very consistent. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 5. And besides this, give all diligence. Okay, uh, okay, yeah, sorry. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue okay your faith guess what that is that's you came to christ that's salvation right that's your faith it was easy it didn't take a lot of diligence diligence is the work by which we're going to add to our faith it's not it's not for salvation it's just what we're, we're building upon that foundation okay and here's what it says to add it says to add uh, to your faith virtue that's just doing good things being faithful showing up to church you know uh, showing up for soul winning. Do, what you can, whether you have the knowledge and the understanding about all the doctrinal things or not, no, we're just doing it. We're being there. We're supporting each other. We're being uh, we're virtuous, you know, uh, good behavior, all those kinds of things. That's the first thing. Just start, you know, add that to your faith. And then to add to your virtue, knowledge. All right, we go to church and uh, learn the Bible. We go home and we read our Bible. We try to get on a routine of reading our Bible daily so we can maybe listen to some preaching to help us out. But we're growing in knowledge, right, of the Word of God. Add to knowledge, temperance. We could all use some temperance in our life, right? That's a big, now we're getting into some deeper, harder things in the Christian's walk. To be temperate, to be patient. Add to patience, godliness. Add to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, Charity. And charity, of course, is love. But if you read uh, 1 Corinthians 13, right, he's saying, no matter what, you know, I have to do everything with love, with charity, right? I have to do everything that I do. It has to be done with, with charity. And if you look at the context there, he's talking a lot about giving the gospel to people, right? He's talking a lot about making sure they understand what he's saying. And it's not like some, you know, tinkling symbol or whatever, but they understand what he's saying and he's clear. He's, and so I think a lot of that charity has to do with preaching the gospel, being clear, communicating, right? Uh, but that's, that's the last thing that you see here, too, in the list, right? Okay. <clears throat> well, now, why did I say that? Look back to Hebrews. Okay, so Hebrews chapter 6, we saw this. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again, and then he just defines some of these doctrines. <clears throat> and then, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain Paul wrote uh, Hebrews, okay? And one of the things Paul does in his writings is... He kind of writes a lot like I talk. Like I just start talking about one subject and I'll kind of add a little extra thought inside that subject. Sometimes in that subject, I'll add another one. I'm like three, four layers deep in my thought. And I, I always forget where I was going <laughs> the first time. Paul writes like that. So you see that in Hebrews, you're like, okay, now he's going to break off and he's going to start talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you fall away from these things, and then next thing you know, he's talking about the priest and the Old Testament and all that. But it's not saying, hey, we've moved on from those simple things, so now let's talk about the deep things about the priest and Melchizedek and all that stuff. Actually, he's just kind of taking a little side trail for a minute. But when you follow it out and you keep going, he's going to come back to several things that you should do that should accompany your salvation. And here's what they are. Look at chapter 10. I'm sure I missed some, but I want to. I want to. I want to show you this. <clears throat> Chapter ten, verse twenty-five, or actually verse 20, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith, without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto good, uh, unto love, and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, isn't that interesting? Well, here's what he's saying. 
He's saying, look, here's what you're going to do. Uh, let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, right? You're considering one another, provoking one another to good works. You're going to church, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, right? What is all that? That is virtue, adding virtue to your faith, right? Let's go to chapter 12, verse 1. Chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction uh, of sinners against him, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So now we're talking about somebody living by faith. We're talking about somebody who is enduring trials and hardships and all those things to come. Well, guess what that is? Temperance, patience, long-suffering. Right? These are all the things that you're adding to your, 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 the fact that you're saved. Great. You've been baptized. Great. Right? You're trying to, uh, you know, maybe in a church setting, we've got somebody who is the pastor, maybe somebody qualified to be the deacon. We've got that settled. Great. We know a little bit about end times. We know about eternal judgment. We know that. Great. Now let's start living like Christians. Let's add some virtue to that. Now let's add some knowledge to that and start studying the Bible, start soaking that up. Now we got some knowledge. Let's add some temperance. Let's add some patience. You see what I'm saying? He's adding to that. And then look at chapter 13, verse 1. Anybody have 2 Peter 1 memorized? You know what the next one is? Add to your, uh, add to virtue, uh, uh, add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience. Patience, godliness, and then brotherly kindness. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Amen. Boy, that's a, good, <laughs> that's a good thing to add to your faith, right? That's a good thing to add to, your, uh, to accompany your salvation. Let brotherly love continue. Now look at chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. That's pretty good admonition. In fact, Paul gives that admonition a lot to Amen. Timothy, to Titus. Right. He's like, you know what? Doctrine is important, but don't start getting carried away with everything that comes. And Well, what do you think about this? Or maybe this is more important. Or what if you did it this way? And come on, man, just, just let's stick with the basics. But let's add to that basics things that are actually profitable. You know, not saying doctrine is not important. Doctrine is important. But you got the basic foundations down. Here's what we need to add to our, uh, to that are actually works. Okay, good, good things that we do. And now we're talking about following the leader, obeying them, being committed to uh, getting the job done. I kind of lost my place here. I think I was in, uh, I don't know, verse 8. Uh, let's go with 9. Be not carried away with diverse strange doctrine. There we were. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them and have not accompanied therein. We have an altar, wherefore... Uh, they have no right to eat which serve the tables for the bodies uh, of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, I think I read too far, actually. No, let's keep going. Uh, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the, the camp, bearing his reproach uh, for here, I'm sorry, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Amen. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls 
as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I preached this morning on how uh, one of the things I talked about is how the commandments, the Bible says, are not grievous. God's commandments are not grievous to you. Like you might think, especially if you're a young person in here and mommy says, hey, you got to be in bed by such and such a time. And mommy says, you got to wear this. No, you can't go outside without your coat on. Yeah, you have to eat all your vegetables. You have to do all this. And you're thinking, man, rules, 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 rules. <laughs> I don't even know if my parents love me. They just make me follow all these rules. Well, guess what? They're doing it for your own good. Right. And they want you to get better. Their commandments aren't grievous. And so when you follow them, it's actually good for you, is what the Bible says. So we do the same thing when we're following those who God's putting an authority over our life. And, uh, and really, the whole point is that we're getting the, the job done. We're communicating. We're praising God. We're doing uh, what He wants us to do. There's a lot of talk there about, uh, uh, about communicating. And, and I can't remember how it says, uh, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. All right? So I think, you know, that... I think you could fit right in there, and I could keep going with some other verses, but charity. You know, charity is the last thing where we're just serving the Lord, and we're giving to others, and we're communicating, and we're doing the work uh, that we've been called to do. The Bible is very consistent on this, very consistent. The doctrine's important, but what he's want, expecting you to do, what he's waiting for and watching for you to do, is to move on from those fundamental things and began to do some of the works. Okay, look at uh, Titus 1 again. So yes, we need to get repentance right. What does repentance mean? We need to be solid on that. That's great. We need to understand baptisms. We need to understand the qualifications of a pastor and a deacon. But incidentally, let's see what those are. What is it expected about a pastor? I know, let's just think, let's not look at it for a minute, let's just think. What, what do you want your pastor to be? Well, he, he ought to be handsome, right? Check. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> your pastor ought to be a dynamic preacher. Uh-oh. Your, your pastor ought to be able to just confound people with his wisdom. Uh-oh. <laughs> you heard here, right? In fact, actually... I heard somebody just recently say, man, I wouldn't ordain a pastor unless he was a dynamic, you know, exciting preacher. Well, that would be a great benefit if he was. But you know what? That's not the most important thing that qualifies somebody as being a pastor. That's not what qualifies someone to be a deacon. That's not what qualifies any of us to be able to do the work that God's called us to do is like how much you know. It's not. Or how, how uh, uh, smooth we are with our words, how eloquent we are. That's not it. Here's what, it go, here's what he says, Titus 1.6. Oh, let's back up to 5. I always go too far. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders, that's preachers, bishops, however you want to say it, elders in every city as I have appointed thee. Now here he explains what the qualifications are. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Do all these things sound familiar? That's exactly the types of things we're supposed to be adding to our faith, right? Holding fast the faithful word. Now, here we go. It is important. It is important that we know doctrine. We understand the Bible. Holding fast to, to the faithful word as he hath been taught that he might be able to uh, able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly, vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And he goes on in this. <clears throat> but do you notice of that whole list of qualifications, there's only one that really talks about holding fast to the word. Doesn't it talk about how, how well they, and eloquent they must be or how, how intelligent they must be? It, it's just saying that they're going to hold fast to those words. Stand firm on that. Not, not let go of them. And you know what? A person who's temperate, a person who's 
uh, who can control their flesh, you know, control their desires, someone who's not angry, someone who's hospitable, someone who loves the brethren and does all those things in that list, you know, been faithful to his wife and raising his kids right and all that kind of stuff. He's do all those things, probably going to hold on to sound doctrine, probably not going to let those things go. Probably you don't have to worry. That's probably a person you can trust. So if you're looking for a leader, you're looking for somebody to be the pastor or someone to ordain as, an, as a deacon or, or whatever, we're not necessarily looking for the brightest, the smartest, the one that can, you know, uh, uh, just, just, you know, has the most wit, can knock somebody down, you know, if they, if they say the wrong word or they say the wrong thing. Somebody. Now, I mean, I, you know, occasionally I get in the flesh and I enjoy being a little witty to somebody, <laughs> right? But, uh, but that's not really what you're looking for. You're looking for somebody who's very grounded and they're ready to do, uh, you know, they're ready to serve the Lord in all these ways. And incidentally, the whole reason for having a leader, whole reason for having a pastor and deacons and, and people that are legion is that they're setting the example for the flock. So the flock can do the exact same thing that they're doing. All right. So they're by example showing you how to live your life. Doctrine is super important. Don't get me don't don't misunderstand that. But you're gonna have to do, you're gonna have to make sure that doctrine is useful. Right? And the, and the, you do the things, uh, it's it's uh, uh, be things that becomes sound doctrine. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us uh, what we are to believe from your word and, and what to, what doctrines to hold on to and and uh, and just particularly how clear salvation is, how we can know for sure we're saved and we can uh, begin right away after we get saved telling other people how to get saved. It doesn't take a whole lot of work. But Lord, we know our whole life is going to be, uh, is going to take diligence and it's going to take hard work controlling the appetites of the flesh and controlling our, our behavior and, and our temper and and all that, Lord, I pray that you help us to be mature Christians and focus on those those types of things even more so uh, than just how much we know. Uh, we certainly do want you to help us learn and help us grow in knowledge, but help us grow also in virtue and, and in patience and all those things. Lord, we love you and want you to be glorified in all we do. Bless this work and uh, bless this day in Jesus' name. Amen.